The Mile High Flood District's Detention Basin Design Workbook is one of the most versatile software programs they have developed. The workbook is intended to provide a flexible user interface that can help to size a wide variety of preliminary design configurations, as well as evaluate existing facilities with site-specific stage storage discharge relationships. This intentional flexibility, however, results in a more complicated user interface and the potential for confusion when evaluating results. Therefore, the district has developed several instructional videos to help users better navigate the workbook. My name is Derek Rapp, and in this video, I'm going to answer some frequently asked questions and discuss mistakes commonly made by users. The video will consist of several short segments and will jump around to various parts of the workbook. Therefore, if you are new to the detention workbook, I would suggest you watch the overview and example videos first, as those videos walk you through the entire workbook. This video is broken into several chapters as seen here in the table of contents. If you move the cursor over the video timeline at the bottom of the screen, the various chapter segments are visible. Feel free to skip ahead to chapters of interest if you do not wish to watch the entire video. Prior to discussing specific questions and common mistakes, I want to remind you that the User Tips and Tools worksheet within the workbook provides a few helpful tips to remember. You can always check this worksheet for advice, and as new updates to the workbook are released, additional user tips may be added. Now we will look at the Basin Worksheet and discuss some frequently asked questions starting with the Tributary Watershed Input section. Some people have asked why they need to provide input parameters for the Tributary Watershed and run CUHP if they plan to use their own inflow hydrographs. This question may stem from complex watersheds that have been modeled as several distinct subcatchments, or because they have used a hydrologic method different than CUHP. The simple answer is because many parts of the workbook are dependent on these sections being completed prior to allowing subsequent calculations to be performed. For example, the water quality capture volume, excess urban runoff volume, and empirical detention volume estimates for each design storm cannot be calculated until these parameters are provided. Many other parts of the workbook depend on these calculated volumes in order to determine approximate stage elevations for the basin geometry and outlet structure components. Therefore, the user must always provide approximate tributary watershed input parameters, even if they are an oversimplification of the actual watershed. However, the user then has the ability to override the water quality capture volume, excess urban runoff volume, zone detention volumes, and the stage area relationship for the basin geometry on this worksheet, as well as the inflow hydrographs and pre-development peak flows for each design storm on the outlet structure worksheet. Another frequently asked question is why the approximate stage and volume values on the basin worksheet don't always match the stage and volume values in the routed hydrograph results table on the outlet structure worksheet. On the basin worksheet, the approximate detention volumes are calculated based on empirical equations developed from hundreds of CUHP model runs. The empirical equations can be seen on the reference worksheet. The detention volume equations are dependent on precipitation depth, watershed area, percent imperviousness, and soil type. For more detailed explanation of how the equations were developed to provide a best fit to the CUHP model runs, see the technical memorandum on the district's resource library. These approximate detention volumes are only intended to provide the program with a starting point for purposes of estimating the preliminary basin geometry based on the user input constraints provided below. After the preliminary basin geometry is determined, a complete stage area volume table is generated that provides the approximate detention volumes. As for the estimated stage values, these are determined through a lookup function that finds the estimated detention volume in the stage area volume table and returns the corresponding stage value. For example, the 100 year volume of approximately 2 acre feet is found here with a corresponding stage of just under 6 feet. If we switch to the outlet structure worksheet, we see that the estimated zone volumes and corresponding stage values are carried over and shown here, as indicated by the 100 year stage of just under 6 feet and the total volume of approximately 2 acre feet. These estimated stage values help the program to set starting elevations for the various outlet structure components, such as the orifice inverts and weir crests. Keep in mind that the user can modify any of these starting elevations provided by the program. However, when we scroll down and look at the routed hydrograph results table, we will see slightly different results for stage and volume than what we have discussed up to this point. As for the maximum volume stored, these are the actual storage volumes required based on routing the design storm inflow hydrographs through the basin and outlet structure using the modified pulse routing method. This method accounts for the specific stage volume relationship of the basin as well as the timing of the inflow hydrograph relative to the outflow through the outlet structure configuration. Similarly, the maximum ponding depth is also calculated using the modified pulse routing method to determine the maximum stage reached within the basin when routing the design storm through the basin and outlet structure. 
These routed results may be slightly different than the empirical equation results for a variety of reasons. The primary difference, though, is that the specific basin geometry and outlet configuration being evaluated is most likely different than the default assumptions used for the hundreds of CUHP model runs that the empirical equations are based on. If we compare the maximum ponding depth to the estimated stage values for this example, we see slight differences ranging from minus 2% to 1%. If we compare the maximum volume stored in the estimated detention volumes, we see slight differences ranging from minus 4% to plus 2%. These are small differences which indicate that for this example, the empirical equations provided reasonably good initial estimates. Regardless of the differences, the router results in the summary table are more accurate than the empirical equations. Some people have mistakenly selected storage volumes for zone 1 and zone 3 on the basin worksheet, but have skipped zone 2. This mistake was most likely based on the assumption that zone 3 is always the 100-year storage zone. For example, a person designing a water quality facility with 100-year detention, but not including full-spectrum detention, may select water quality capture volume for Zone 1 and 100-year storage for Zone 3, without selecting excess urban runoff volume for Zone 2. This will lead to problems in subsequent calculations on the outlet structure worksheet because there is no Zone 2 volume selected. Users should never skip zones regardless of the design storms being included in the design. For this example, the user should instead select the 100-year storage volume in Zone 2 pull-down and leave the Zone 3 pull-down blank. There is a common complaint from users that sometimes the program seems to slow down when attempting to update user input values. I will now explain why this happens and provide several useful tips to help alleviate this sluggish response when entering data. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, the workbook was intended to provide versatility for numerous types of designs and various forms of user input. Therefore, in order to ensure the program automatically updated results anytime the user made an input change, several benchmarks for user input were established. These benchmarks notify the program that the user has entered the required input values necessary to proceed in calculating the associated results. For example, once all the tributary watershed parameters are provided, a benchmark is reached to run CUHP and automatically calculate the estimated detention volumes. Similarly, once the zone volumes are selected and the basin geometry constraints are provided, a benchmark is reached and the program will automatically generate the stage area volume relationship. As the user moves through each of these benchmarks in the intended sequence, the user inputs can be entered without slowing down in the program. However, if the user were to go back to a previous section and change something later, the program may have a sluggish response. This is primarily because the program has to run through all of the previous benchmarks for calculation again and update all the associated results. The further the user was into the preliminary design process, the longer the calculation updates will take when changing one of the initial user input values. Therefore, if you need to go back and change several inputs early in the design process, consider clearing one or more of the benchmarks in order to prevent the program from bogging down. For example, if you want to change the zone volume pull-down selections or some of the basin geometry constraints, but you have already created a stage area volume table, consider temporarily clearing one of the basin geometry constraints prior to making the updates so that the benchmark is cleared and the program doesn't try to recalculate the stage area volume table after every input change. The same concept applies to the outlet structure worksheet when going back to modify parts of the outlet structure. If all of the necessary inputs have been provided, the program will automatically update all of the modified pulse routing methods each time a user input value is changed. Another area where the program may seem to bog down is when entering override values for stage and area in the stage area volume table. The workbook is set up to populate the stage area volume table when the number of stage overrides and area overrides are equal. Therefore, it is best to enter all of the stage overrides first, then go back and enter all of the area overrides. This way, the table doesn't populate until all values are entered. If you were to enter the stage and area overrides row by row, the program would populate the table after every row was entered, which would take much longer. The fastest way to enter values into the table is to copy and paste all of the stage values at once, and then to copy and paste all of the area values. As with many parts of this workbook, it is always recommended that you use the copy-paste function and not the cut-paste function, because the cut function can unintentionally break cell references in the workbook. Similarly, the user should never insert, delete, or shift rows and columns as this can have unintended consequences. Users have asked why the automated sizing buttons for the outlet structures are sometimes not visible. This is because the sizing buttons only apply to specific outlet configurations and will disappear when not applicable. 
I will briefly discuss the various sizing buttons and the scenarios they are visible for. The first button calculates the underdrain orifice diameter that will match the water quality drain time. This button is only visible for rain gardens and sand filters when zone 1 is the water quality capture volume, which is drained through filtration media. This button calculates the water quality plate geometry necessary to match the water quality drain time. This button is only visible when water quality capture volume is selected for the zone 1 storage and either an orifice plate or elliptical slot is selected to drain it out. The button off to the side here is intended to help size the water quality plate to drain the excess urban runoff volume over a user specified drain time. This button is visible for two different scenarios. The first is when the water quality capture volume in zone 1 is drained through filtration media and the excess urban runoff volume in zone 2 drains through a water quality plate. The second is when the zone 1 volume is equal to the excess urban runoff volume minus the water quality capture volume because the latter is treated upstream in a separate facility. The button below is similar in that it is intended to help size a vertical orifice opening to drain the excess urban runoff volume over a user specified drain time. This button is visible for three different scenarios. The first two are the same as the previous button, with the exception that the excess urban runoff volume drains through the vertical orifice instead of the water quality plate. The third scenario is when the zone 1 water quality capture volume drains through the water quality plate and the zone 2 excess urban runoff volume drains through a vertical orifice. The next button is intended to help size an overflow weir to control the 100 year release rate to 90% of pre-development peak flows. This button is only visible for a full spectrum detention approach where 100 year detention is selected for the zone 3 storage and the zone 3 outlet type is a simple overflow weir without a drop box or outlet pipe. The next button is similar in that it is intended to help size an outlet pipe with a restrictor plate to control the 100 year release rate to 90% of pre-development peak flows. This button is only visible for a full spectrum detention approach where the 100 year detention is selected for zone 3 storage and the zone 3 outlet type is one of the three overflow weir and pipe with restriction plate options. The adjacent button is intended to help the user size an outlet pipe that will pass the undetained 100 year peak flow without providing detention. This button is only visible when the user has not selected 100 year detention storage for any of the zones and has selected an outlet pipe with either a circular or rectangular orifice plate. The final button for sizing the spillway is always visible, regardless of the outlet configuration. Although the workbook is designed to help the user develop a stage discharge relationship, there may be times when a user wants to evaluate a known stage discharge relationship, but doesn't know how to enter the values in the workbook. The user override stage discharge relationship can be entered on the bottom part of the outlet structure worksheet. Simply scroll down below the routed hydrograph results table and click on the button that says Show Stage Storage Discharge Table. The complete stage storage discharge table will open and you can enter in the override discharge values in column E. Questions have come up regarding the use of the brim full capacity for the water quality capture volume and excess urban runoff volume versus the use of inflow hydrographs for the design storms. Therefore, I will explain how the workbook functions with respect to this. The district measures the drain time for the water quality capture volume with respect to brim full capacity. For example, an extended detention basin is designed to start brim full and empty out over a 40 hour period. The excess urban runoff volume may take up to 72 hours to empty from the brim full capacity. If we look at the center figure on the outlet structure worksheet, you can quickly see how the detention workbook routes the different runoff events using the modified pulse routing method. Both the water quality capture volume and excess urban runoff volume start at time zero with a brim full capacity and slowly empty out in order to determine the drain time. The design storms, on the other hand, account for the inflow hydrograph filling up the detention basin while simultaneously releasing flow through the outlet structure. This is representative of how the detention basin functions during an actual storm event. For a typical full spectrum detention design, both approaches provide the desired results. However, there are design scenarios where the brimful capacity approach can result in confusing information. For example, if the workbook is being used to design a facility for water quality only, with larger events passing through undetained, the results for the excess urban runoff volume may not make sense. Here we see a design with only the water quality capture volume selected as zone 1. When we switch to the outlet structure worksheet, we see that the water quality capture volume has a depth of 2.4 feet and is released over 40 hours using an orifice plate. The design also includes an overflow weir and pipe with a circular orifice plate to pass the developed 100 year peak flow th through the basin undetained. If we scroll down and look at the routed hydrograph results table, we see the 100 year event reaches a maximum ponding depth of 2.8 feet, less than a half foot above the overflow weir crest. 
The peak inflow rate of 7 cubic feet per second is being released at a rate of 6.7 cubic feet per second, indicating there was no attenuation of the peak flow. However, if you look closer at the excess urban runoff volume, you may notice that the emergency spillway is controlling the release rate and the maximum ponding depth is higher than the 500-year design storm. This is because the program assumes that the excess urban runoff volume starts at the brim full capacity in order to determine the drain time. Based on the stage volume relationship for the basin, the brim full capacity of the excess urban runoff volume results in an initial stage of over 4 feet. In this type of scenario, the excess urban runoff volume results are meaningless and can be ignored because the design is not intended to detain any event larger than the water quality capture volume. That concludes this video. I hope it was helpful in understanding how to avoid common mistakes. Be sure to check out the other instructional videos available.